Remember when Valve used to, like, actually make games? Those were the days, eh? Well, that's not really fair of me to say, I guess, because, you know, they did make Half-Life Alex, But Half-Life Alex was a VR exclusive, which means that most people couldn't really play it. Oh, and there's also Artifact. But Valve games are regarded as being some of the best games in the history of the industry. Critically acclaimed masterpieces that influenced pop culture for years. But Valve has made a lot of games. A lot more games than you probably realised. So I took this Wikipedia list of all Valve games and I used it as a sort of checklist. I played every single game on this list and I only gave myself a week to do it. The only games on this list that I didn't play were the two VR exclusive titles and Aperture Desk Job, because I didn't fancy spending £1,500 on a Steam Deck and a VR headset just to make this video. If you want to skip around to whichever game you want to hear me talk about, there'll be timestamps for every single game, because you know I'm good like that. Oh, and also there's spoilers to Valve games in this video, obviously. Luckily for me in my challenge, Valve's very first game in their back catalogue just so happens to be one of the most influential games to ever be created. Half-Life, for a lot of people, is a game that needs no introduction at all. But the game came out in 1998, which is older than me, and probably older than most of the people watching this video, too. But the original Half-Life was revolutionary for the time. More revolutionary than most people probably realised. Every single first-person shooter that came out before Half-Life was practically the same. They were all long, sprawling levels with enemies slapped in the middle that had no overarching story or theme to it. They incentivized exploration, but only as a means to find ammo and armour and stuff like that. Most of them were 2D graphics that look like this. Although some of them, like the original Quake, did have 3D graphics, but their gameplay was very similar. Half-Life changed all of this. Most video games at the time had no interest in telling a story, so Half-Life trying to tell a meaningful story was an insane concept. And for a first-person shooter, no less, it was completely revolutionary. And even by today's standards, the story is pretty easy to understand. The story is very well told, even if the story of Half-Life 1 isn't exactly that complicated. It tells you its stories through the these cool cutscenes and through dialogue of NPCs. Scientists tell you that the military is coming to save you, and then those same scientists warn you that the military is trying to kill everyone who witnessed the accident. Realistically speaking, this is a pretty complex concept to convey in a video game that is as old as Half-Life is, but it does a very great job at doing it anyway. It never feels the need to force your camera to look at something, or give you a pre-rendered cutscene. The game rarely, if ever, takes control from you, something that Future Valve will also be very good at doing. There are modern day games that could use the subtlety that Half-Life had 24 years ago. Considering the time period it released in, Half-Life is still a pretty fun game to play through. But that being said, I can't say that it's aged very well. The visuals are not very good, understandably. And these bad visuals on nice shiny modern monitors can actually get in the way of gameplay a little bit. The AI is very impressive by the time period standards, and actually revolutionised a lot of tech that is still used in modern video game AI. But through a modern lens, the friendly and enemy NPCs alike are both very, very stupid. <laughs> Also, the game has mouse acceleration on by default, with no way to turn it off in the settings. You have to use launch options to get rid of it. There's also the bugs. Small things you can get past, like being able to push buttons through walls. Like, it's kind of funny. It lets you skip some stuff at some points in the game. Like, it lets you stand outside under a rocket launch in a later chapter of the game. But there's also the wackier things, like a door that can give you infinite HP if you get stuck in it. Or the fact that I got stuck in a wall and had to turn on no clip to get out, not once, but twice. Once where I jumped into a corner full of rubble to see if I could clip through a wall or something and I got completely stuck. And once because I was holding D into a wall while a loading screen happened and when the loading screen ended I was stuck in the wall and couldn't move. And there's another thing I thought I'd mention that is likely going to be a theme of this entire video. And that's the fact that I have been a fan of Source games and Gold Source games for practically my entire life. And the Source engine is famous for its jank. And knowledge of this jank made me do some very very funny, wacky, stupid things in my run. Bunny hopping alone probably saved me an hour of runtime in Half-Life 1. And being a fan of watching speedruns made me even more aware of some of the dumb things that you can get away with. In fact, I literally skipped an entire chapter of Half-Life 1 using a speedrun skip, because I knew how. You get placeable trip mines right at the start of this chapter, and you can actually place them on walls and stand on them, and then use them to jump over a barrier that you're meant to break at the end of the chapter. Why did I do this? Because I can.
Because it's funny. The Source engine and its jank is actually a huge part of the reason why I love Source games so much. The fast movement that these janky things enable is unparalleled to any other game that exists. And the glitches you can use to your advantage, although unintended, are incredibly fun to use. But in a challenge like this, rolling around at the speed of sound might make my perception of the game a little bit different than that of the average player trying to play it for the first time. But Half-Life 1 is a fantastic game. Despite some annoyances throughout my playthrough that were caused by old video game jank, I had a ton of fun. And the story is amazing. And despite being told in a very old video game, it's told incredibly well. Half-Life revolutionized the gaming industry. There's no doubt about it. And despite how old and crusty it might be by today's standards, it deserves every single bit of praise that it gets. Team Fortress Classic is a forgotten video game compared to its shinier younger brother. Because there's a 2 in Team Fortress 2, but nobody ever questions where that 2 comes from most of the time. Well, it's this. This is Valve's first ever Team Fortress title, and it was the first video game that I ever played. Picture me at 5 years old staring at my screen trying to play this. I had no idea what the hell was happening, but the crazy flashing colours on my screen clearly had me hooked on video games for the rest of my life. Once upon a time, there was a mod for Quake called Team Fortress. Fortress. The Team Fortress Quake mod was so popular that 50% of all multiplayer servers in Quake were playing this mod. So Valve decided they were going to hire the developers of this Team Fortress mod and put them to work. Which is the first of many, many times that Valve did this. They were hired to make a port of their mod to the Gold Source engine, and so Team Fortress Classic was born. Team Fortress Classic is an amazing core concept, and it's still relatively fun to play today. But if you try and play it yourself, the first thing you'll notice is the lack of populated servers. The the only way you're likely able to play this game is if you play against bots, because there's not really any human players left. There are at least custom community bots in some servers, and those custom community bots are a whole lot smarter than the classic Valve bots that were in the game on release. But they're still bots nonetheless. It's never the same as playing against people. And the game's pretty cool. It has the makings of all the awesome things that Team Fortress 2 and the Source Engine in general would be known for. Rocket jumping's here, but it gets vastly overshadowed by conk jumping. Classes with concussion grenades can use them to fling themselves incredibly fast and far without dealing any damage to themselves outside of full damage. But both rocket jumping and conk jumping at the time were entirely unintended mechanics. In the sequel, these movement mechanics were intentionally put into the game, even if the devs likely didn't realise how complex these mechanics would become. But in Team Fortress Classic, these movement mechanics were unforeseen consequences of the crazy engine that they'd developed. Oh, and there's also bunny hopping, just like Half-Life 1. It used to be able to give you infinite speed speed, but they patched it so that there's a speed cap on your b-hops, even though it still makes you move much faster than you would do if you didn't do it. And this made class balance a little bit stupid, because Scout was by far the fastest class. He had conk grenades to jump with and he could get up to crazy bunny hop speeds really fast, but his damage was incredibly low. The medic also had conk grenades for crazy movement, and he could b-hop just like everybody else, but his shotgun output far more damage than the scouts did. So with b-hop move speed being infinite on release, the medic was actually better at being a scout than the scout was at being a scout, because Medic could go just as fast as Scout could, use the same conk jumping techniques, but he had more damage to back up his mobility. The Heavy could also be hop around as fast as anybody else could, so his insane DPS made some classes completely obsolete, because his move speed being low was irrelevant. Funnily enough, despite how different Team Fortress Classic is from the sequel, it actually feels like it's held back by a lot of the same things. The Sniper class has the exact same problem in this game as it does in Team Fortress 2. He's the only class in the game that doesn't have to fight in close or medium range, so interacting with him can be hard. Conk jumping at him at high speeds doesn't work if he has really good aim, so you either play sniper yourself or you can't really counter him at all. And the maps here are really, really bad. Like CTF Well, for example. There's basically just two ways to leave your base. One main door and one super secret flank route. This is not enough though. Just sitting and defending two doors as an entire team is incredibly easy. Easy. Combine this with the ability to build engineer turrets in the main room that leads directly to the flag, this means that the overwhelming majority of games end in a stalemate. Dust Bowl's here too, and if you've played TF2 then I likely don't need to tell you why this map is bad, because it's basically the same in Team Fortress Classic. Team Fortress Classic also has grenades, a system that was removed from Team Fortress 2, but they were removed for good reason, because grenades were a little bit brain dead. Outside of conk jumping, there was not really any interesting things you did with grenades. You could just toss 
toss out all of your grenades for free if you knew that you were about to die, and there was no downside to doing this whatsoever. The mobility that conk jumping enabled was great, but every other use case for grenades was very one-dimensional. You either throw it at a choke point, or you mash the grenade button as you're about to die. TFC did do some really cool things though. There's these flank routes in well that are covered by bars. The only way to break it open is if a demo man lays a special debt pack there to destroy it, which is a pretty neat concept. Team Fortress Classic is an incredibly good core concept that is held back by antiquated mechanics and weird design decisions, but it's revolutionary regardless. The core concept is so good that it can make up for a lot of the dumb stuff that happens incredibly often. And although it might be mostly forgotten now, it's certainly a very good video game that was very much ahead of its time. This game is very strange. It's very, very strange. I'd never heard of it until I started trying to make this video, actually. And that's probably for a really good reason. Ricochet is a multiplayer arena game based off of the Disc Wars from the Tron movies. So you're on these small floating platforms and you throw discs at your opponents. If you left click, the disc you throw deals knockback. So getting hit by a disc is pretty much a guaranteed death sentence because it pushes you off these tiny platforms. But if you right click, the disc will insta-kill whoever it hits, which mostly ends up being redundant because the knockback is mostly enough to insta-kill you anyway. In theory, this game could be really cool. A projectile-based arena game where you're trying to hit gnarly air shots on your opponents could be cool in theory. But Valve butchered the idea. You can look up and down just like you'd expect in a first-person shooter, but you can't throw your discs at an angle. Looking upwards doesn't make you throw the disc upwards. Your discs are locked to only being able to be thrown horizontally. You also cannot jump whatsoever. Your only source of mobility is these bumpers that jump you from one platform to another. But since it is a source game, you can use strafing to gain speed. But you can't jump. So I guess that Valve decided to not add the B-Hop fix to this game like they did in Team Fortress Classic and Half-Life. So you can hit a bumper and strafe extremely quickly to another bumper and just infinitely fly around in circles. And since you can't aim upwards at all, hitting you when you do this is incredibly difficult. Also, every single time you die, without fail, your camera spins around three times while your character screams in terror. Every. Single. Time. It got annoying literally the first time I saw it, and there was no way to turn it off. There's also these, like, bars or whatever littered around the stage. Your discs bounce off of these bars, and I can't really tell why they're there. It just blocks you from throwing at the other side of the map for seemingly no reason. You can also actually strafe to stand on these bars, which makes you functionally immune to being hit by a disc. The only thing anyone can realistically do about it is also strafe over there and hope that they hit you before you hit them. The game is very old and not very good, so unsurprisingly, there's nobody playing it. Although I did have one actual human player join my server, none other than RocketRoo77. He went AFK after about 45 seconds of playing before or leaving immediately afterwards. Rest in peace, Rocket Roo 77. You will be missed. The weird part about this game is that, in theory, it could actually be really, really cool. Like, imagine how cool it would be if your uncapped strafe movement was actually useful for something other than camping, and you could actually aim your discs wherever you wanted. It'd be like a super awesome airshot arena where everyone's trying to gunshot bribe the other player out of the sky. But I guess Valve in the year 2000 didn't think this high skill floor game was worth making, which is perhaps fair enough. But instead of that high skill floor game, they made a game that's barely worth playing at all. A game with incredibly unusual design choices, where the most effective strategy I discovered was to stand at the edge of a bumper and wait for someone to come towards you so you could instantly kill them. Because aiming isn't a thing, and jumping isn't a thing, and there's random obstacles everywhere that you can stand on for some reason, so the game just ends up being in limbo, almost like anything fun or exciting has been stripped away from it. So Ricochet is a completely forgotten Valve game that I'd imagine most people hadn't even heard of. So now you know why you haven't heard of it. Because it's really, really weird. Counter-Strike is another classic case of Valve hiring modders. Some guys made a mod of Half-Life called Counter-Strike, and Valve snatched them up to get them making an official port of Counter-Strike to be released as a standalone game. And the rest is history, with the most modern Counter-Strike title being the most popular game on Steam by a pretty large margin. But I'm gonna be honest, I have so very, very little to say about the original Counter-Strike. I'm not into tactical shooters. I much prefer the crazy fast pace of other styles of FPS games. And Counter-Strike, to me at least, seems like a very 
very similar game to future installments, just without that fresh coat of paint that games like CS Source and CS Go have. The gunplay functions the same, but feels worse to use and is less visually clear as to what's happening. The crosshairs less accurately show your bloom, and the feedback on shooting an enemy is worse. The maps and game modes are functionally the same, but with some slight differences to the new games. Someone with more knowledge about Counter-Strike might have more to say about this video game, but that's not me. The one server I played on had some really annoying plugins that popped shit up on my screen a bunch and had a really crazy announcer that was annoying. There was also an ad on the wall for a website called GameHelper.com, which is hilarious. And this isn't a server thing, this is just baked into the map that Valve made. Apparently people still use GameHelper as a callout in modern Counter-Strike games, which I think is hilarious. The game is mechanically very similar to the Counter-Strike games we know today, just without that sleek exterior. And unfortunately, that's the most I have to say about the game. However, there's some other Counter-Strike games that you likely haven't heard of that I have a whole lot more to say about. I've been going in chronological order so far, from oldest to newest game, but I'm gonna jump out of that for a minute so that I can talk about this hilarious gem of a video game. Counter-Strike was incredibly popular, but Valve seemingly also wanted the CS devs they'd hired to make a single-player experience too. And thus, Condition Zero was born. This game is... Uh, it's bad. This game's not very good. The concept is that they'd create a single-player Counter-Strike experience, with missions taking place on the now iconic maps from the main game. In practice, this idea was executed terribly, because it is literally Counter-Strike, but with bots and a fake progression system that doesn't mean anything. Every single mission is functionally identical. You and your team full of bots go and win three rounds of a Counter-Strike game against an enemy team also full of bots. The difficulty is gated behind how good the bot's aim is and how much brain capacity the bots have. The easier bots literally stare at you for five seconds before shooting and they miss when they do shoot, but the harder bots delete you instantly. The only real difference between the early missions and the hard missions is the map and the difficulty of the bots. They try to add some variety by giving you these challenges, but every single challenge is literally kill X number of enemies with X type weapon, which isn't exciting at all. There is a cool concept where you actually pick your team that's gonna help you, and each unit you can choose as a teammate has like different attributes and stuff. Cool in theory, but in practice you're just hiring a squad of bots that have the same difficulty gate as the enemy bots. The worst bot teammates are dumb in all the same ways that the worst bot enemies are dumb, so it removes all strategy and excitement from the concept entirely. It's Counter-Strike, but if you could only play bot games. I cannot stress enough how it is literally Counter-Strike, but just versus bots. And Counter-Strike, but only against bots, makes Counter-Strike significantly worse. Because the slow-paced strategic gameplay of Counter-Strike is very fun against human players. Feeling like you outsmarted or outplayed a human opponent is a feeling like no other. But standing and watching a sightline on B is really, really boring when your opponents are bots that barely move. And if you die, you have to watch your bots play the round out as if it was a real round of Counter-Strike. So you get to watch in 4K as your bots wander around aimlessly and lose easy fights because they've got crippling brain damage. The concept of Counter-Strike but single player is an interesting one, but this is just not the way to do it. But luckily for us, this was not the only attempt made at creating a single player Counter-Strike game. The other attempt was called Condition Zero Deleted Scenes. This game is at least a real video game. It's not just a port of Counter-Strike but you can only play against bots. They actually made missions and maps especially for this game. There's some semblance of a story even if it's an incredibly generic garbage one. But the game is not exactly the most incredible experience. Far from it. It's more akin to Call of Duty than Half-Life. You just shoot at endless hordes of enemies that stand still and shoot back. And it's not exactly very fun because of it. It's just shooting the same generic enemy target over and over again until the mission ends. There's also these weird moments where progression is gated by these really restrictive tools sometimes. Like this blowtorch, which can only be used in the blowtorch zone. And it has to be specifically used on this exact bit of grey ugly metal texture for it to actually do what it's supposed to do. Or this RC bomb that is sitting on a random shelf that's very easy to walk past that is required to blow this wall open. And also the game is a buggy mess. This NPC is supposed to be following me through this door, but he just won't do it. For absolutely no reason, he just refuses to follow me. He won't walk through this doorway. Like, I can't convince him no to way. follow me. I'm not going any further. 
He's not going any further. Also, this one NPC has a very gruff voice actor, but the moment I actually try to interact with him to make him follow me, his voice actor just changes randomly to some other dude. Thanks. Next time we're out on the town, the tab's on me. Yes. <laughs> what? The game is also incredibly, uh, American. I guess you could say. Each mission takes place in a different location facing different enemies. The majority of these missions are against very generic enemies of the American military. For example, the very first mission. Nameless American soldier crash lands in a helicopter in North Africa. Hordes of generic looking military shooter enemies not only shoot at you, but run at you with machetes and even bomb vests. You're heralded as a hero for ruthlessly gunning down very very large numbers of impoverished to America haters all across the globe. And this continues for the entire game. The game is just incredibly boring and incredibly linear. The story isn't exactly thrilling, there's very little incentive for exploration whatsoever, and you just shoot hundreds of bullets into hundreds of generic enemies until the mission is over. They try to do the odd thing here or there, you know, stealth sections and the like, but it's very few and far between. Not to mention the biggest elephant in the room, which is that this game is absolutely nothing like Counter-Strike, has nothing to do with Counter-Strike, but it has Counter-Strike a strike in the title. And also, this game came out in 2004, which is not only the same year that Counter-Strike Source came out, but it's the same year that Half-Life 2 released. Half-Life 2! What the fu- Deathmatch Classic is essentially a recreation of Deathmatch mode from Quake, but in Half-Life. And it's incredibly fun. As much as it makes me sound like an old man, they really don't make games like this anymore. This game is simple and it's fun. It's a Deathmatch game. You versus however many other players are on the server. There's weapon pickups just laying around, so some strategy comes in around fighting for the areas that the strongest weapons are found in. The gunplay is surprisingly satisfying for a 2001 Gold Source game. It's fast-paced and the guns and movement feeling good is 90% of the way there when you're making a good deathmatch game. There isn't any rocket jumping though, which is definitely a negative when you're trying to remake deathmatch mode from Quake in your game. But I think it's likely not been left out on purpose though, since rocket jumping in the early days was mostly an unintended mechanic, in Valve games and in other games. So Valve probably didn't even realise that they were leaving anything out when their game didn't have rocket jumping. But deathmatch classic, all things considered, is a fun game. I was playing against bots, since the game doesn't have any players nowadays. Although one human player did join my server once. They hadn't changed their default name in the options menu, so they were just called player. They stood still for a while and then they left the game. So whilst playing Gold Source multiplayer games, I did not once actually play the game against a human opponent, despite the fact that I actually encountered two humans, one here and one in Ricochet. The map design is simple, but it's a deathmatch game. It doesn't need to be complicated. Just to give it good high ground and branching paths into different areas and you're golden. The biggest issue really is that you can feel the age of the game, because a simple game that's not got that many features isn't necessarily a problem, but an old game that feels slow and clunky by modern standards is a problem. The visuals are unsurprisingly not great. The guns feel good for the time period, but by modern standards can feel a little bit sluggish, and it doesn't have great feedback when you shoot someone or get shot by someone. It's classic old game stuff, really, but the core concepts are certainly here, just like they are in Quake Deathmatch. Although playing against bots in Gold Source games definitely definitely got a bit lonely after a while. Day of Defeat also had the no players problem, but this was probably the most fun I had playing any multiplayer gold source game. The best description I can give of Day of Defeat is that it's a mashup of two different design concepts. It combines the class-based nature of Team Fortress with the tactical shooter elements of Counter-Strike. Add a World War II aesthetic and suddenly you've got Day of Defeat. It's a very fun game really. Different maps have different countries fighting each other. One map might be the Germans versus the Americans, but a different map might have the British versus as the Germans instead. And different nations had different weaponry in the war, so different maps have different weapons for each class. It's a pretty cool way to get big weapon variety into a game where most classes have to have the same functionality no matter what map you're playing. Considering this game is a gold source game from 2003, the guns feel really good to shoot, much better than any of the games we've mentioned so far. The map design could feel a little bit limiting at times. The game mode is control points, and you realistically only have two directions you can go in from spawn. And there's only a 
small number of meaningful flank routes to take on any given map, some of which are literally just tiny, easily camped tunnels that can only fit one player at a time. Quite frankly, the Day of Defeat franchise dying out is a damn shame, because I personally think that the format of Day of Defeat is a far better way to make a World War military shooter than the games like Call of Duty or Battlefield have ever pulled off. The slow and tactical nature of Day of Defeat combined with the class-based gameplay fits the World War II theme so much better than the standard Call of Duty-esque gameplay that we've become accustomed to nowadays. The classic signs of age are of course all still there, because we're still on the Gold Source engine. Feedback on shooting enemies and being shot, guns feeling sluggish or inaccurate when they're not meant to, visuals being terrible, these things are all still present just like they have been in every game we've mentioned so far. But the Source engine would soon come along and clear all that jank up, and it would clear it up for good. The first port to Valve's shiny new Source engine was Counter-Strike in 2004. The Source engine was a very important new innovation in Valve's development, because all of the antiquated workings of the gold Source engine were done away with in the new Source engine, and the Source engine was one that could be adapted to future games much easier than the old gold Source engine could, and Counter-Strike benefited massively from the new engine. Everything we've already complained about, all of the bad visuals and the weird crosshairs and the bad gunplay and the bad feedback on interactions with enemies Enemies, all of that was gone. The Source engine genuinely made Counter-Strike feel like a brand new game, and the kicker is that they didn't have to make a single gameplay change whatsoever to make it feel this way, and to this day, it still feels good to play. For the first time in my challenge so far, I actually joined a server full of human players, which is probably a testament to the game still feeling fun to play all in itself. The visuals, despite looking old by today's standards, really hold up quite well. It's aged far better than most games that came out in 2004, and that can be said for every Source game made since, too. The game does of course lack all of that shiny trim that CSGO has though. There's no loot boxes and all that kind of stuff, and the buy menu is still that same buy menu that was used in the original Counter-Strike. I did have a pretty strange problem that I encountered though. You might notice that all of my footage comes from this one same map. Well, I tried to play other maps, I tried to join other servers, I really did, but no matter what server I clicked on in the server browser, it would always default connect me back to this one server. I don't know if this is a bug with the server browser, or if it's the server itself using some sort of tactic to force players into the one server to keep player numbers up, but it literally disallowed me from playing in any other server no matter which one I clicked. Counter-Strike Source is literally just a straight upgrade to the original Counter-Strike in every way, including its player numbers. So if you're a big fan of the original Counter-Strike, I don't really know what else I could say to convince you. I'm not personally a very big fan of tactical shooters, really. It's not my sort of game. But what is my sort of game? is surfing and bee hopping. And if you're seriously into surf and bee hop, CS Source is where you'll be. This is the true birthplace of surfing. Surfing existed in CS 1.6, but this is where it was truly made. And this is more my style. I love me a good movement game mode, and one of the best movement game modes out there lives right at the heart of Counter-Strike Source. And if you've never tried it, there's no better time to try it than right now. If this game needs an introduction to you, then you're too young to be watching this video. Go and like, ask your parents if they want to watch it instead, because they were alive when the real games were coming out. Half-Life 2 is actually an 18 year old video game. Turned 18 on November 16th, was just a day or two after I played it for this video. And 18 years is incredibly old for a game, so you might think it doesn't hold up under modern scrutiny. You might think it's not worth playing by today's standards, but honestly? Half-Life 2 is a masterpiece, and although there's the occasional blip here and there caused by its age, for the most part it holds up incredibly well. It holds up better than some games that came out significantly more recently. Half-Life 2 was revolutionary at the time, with a physics system that could be actively interacted with in a way that no other game had really accomplished at the time. By today's standards, the physics system is actually very simple, and it's exploitable in more ways than one. You can bonk objects into characters' heads to make them teleport, which makes makes cutscenes go by faster. Or you can mash the pick up button and the jump button really fast while stood on top of an object to climb up walls and basically fly. And the car did this like weird and wacky flip when I tried to flip it over when it got dropped upside down from that magnet in that one part of coast. But something that Half-Life 2 does that I feel that not enough modern games really do at all is they actually utilize the physics system that they built to its fullest potential. Many modern games have physics systems that make Half-Life 2s look like a joke, but they don't use it in nearly 
literally half the creative ways that Half-Life 2 did all the way back in 2004. The game invented this crazy cool physics system, so it understandably wanted to make the most out of it to impress its players. The gravity gun is the best example of this. It's an incredible addition to the game. It lets you use the various physics objects around the world as weapons, and it lets you solve puzzles with them, and even do quirky little tech like this, where you can use it to pick up grenades and throw them at enemies, timing the explosion to go off right as it connects with them. More modern games with more advanced physics systems still somehow struggle to utilise them as well as Half-Life 2 did 18 years ago. And the way in which it's taught to new players is just as genius. I actually have an entire video talking about that already, linked in the link places. The story of Half-Life is continued with even more complexity and nuance than in the first game, yet this extra complexity doesn't prevent the game from telling its story in an incredibly captivating way, with some of the most iconic cutscenes in video game history leaving a huge impression on you the moment you load up the game. The gameplay is awesome, fighting enemies feels amazing, with not only the gravity gun being an amazing way to create emerging gameplay mechanics, but just the variety of weapons and their uses makes for great combat encounters, with enemies that are smarter than they've ever been before. Although despite the AI being much much smarter, it is still 2004. You're a genius. And the friendly NPCs that are a part of the resistance that follow you around at some points in the game are completely unbearable. They can body block you and they will follow you an inch behind at all times and it's absolutely rage inducing. Oh and there's also the one guy on that sentry turret in that one part of the game that uh He's, he's not very smart. There is the odd hiccup that comes down to the game being 18 years old, but considering that this game came out at the same time as these games, Half-Life 2 is honestly astounding. Raven Home is actually one of the most incredible sequences in any video game. Everything about it is incredible, and the subtle world building throughout the entire game is just amazing. But like I talked about with Half-Life 1, I've been playing Source games since before some of you were even born, and I know every little dirty trick in the book. You see, in Half-Life 1, there was bunny hopping. Jumping the instant you hit the ground while turning left and right would actually give you speed. Much more speed than just walking around ever could. And Valve didn't like this. It allowed you to skip parts of the game and evade enemies far too easily. So in Half-Life 2, Valve decided to implement a fix to this. Their fix was that if you were not holding W and you tried to b-hop off the ground, the game would add negative speed to your character, which forced you to never go above walking speed. This fix is very simple, which makes it sound great on paper, but often Oftentimes, simple solutions just aren't good enough. Because in practice, this simple solution allows you to do this. People realise that if you just jump, crouch and turn around, doing these little b-hops can gain you a huge amount of speed, and you gain speed significantly faster than b-hopping ever allowed. So in preventing you from b-hopping, they enabled a tech far more game-breaking. The tech became known as Accelerated Backwards Hopping, or ABH for short. And knowledge of this tech made me do some really really dumb goblin shit in my Half-Life 2 run. In Coast, I decided that instead of going up to this area over here and doing like some dumb crane puzzle, I I was just gonna, you know, not do that. But the car is still down here below this cliff behind me, so I had to just abandon it, doing the rest of coast without the car at all. I did things like this throughout my entire run, and honestly, I think I had more fun because of it. Like, look at this crazy clip I got. Didn't expect that, did you? <laughs> You're never gonna get a clip like that without some classic source engine jank. I also managed to wall bug on a wall to stop myself taking fall damage in a certain section. Oh, please. Oh yeah. <laughs> I play TF2 jump maps. My biggest complaint with Half-Life 2 is actually very simple. The game can get a little bit repetitive towards the end. There are multiple sections in a row that are simply just fight lots of enemies and wait for something to happen. These sections are fine in isolation, but having too many of them back to back became a little bit tedious. There are multiple use turrets to defend place moments all in a row in Nova Prospect. There's also a lot of combat sections back to back that are all practically the same, which again, in isolation, they're incredibly fun. 
but all together in a row, it can get a little bit boring. It can also be a little bit tough to know where to go sometimes. When you're in a giant courtyard and the place you need to go is like this one tiny door all the way over here. You'll find it eventually. It's not like it's hard, but sometimes it can feel a little bit arbitrary. But outside of those tiny gripes, I think that Half-Life 2 is a masterpiece. In my opinion, it's one of the best games ever made. It revolutionized so much, and despite being an incredibly old video game, 90% of the time it feels like it's barely aged a day since 2004. So you know how we just talked about Half-Life 2 and how the combat is really, really, really good and that the physics system is amazing and the gravity gun allows you to utilize it in combat? Well, imagine all of that awesome stuff I just said, but instead of being against nameless enemy NPCs in scripted missions, it's against actual human players over the internet. Half-Life 2 Deathmatch is literally that exact video game and it is pure, unadulterated fun because it's a very clever move from Valve if you actually think about it because all of the heavy lifting has already been done by a Half-Life 2. The core mechanics and making the guns feel good and all the assets and stuff, those things have already been made for Half-Life 2's base game. So adding those incredibly fun and well-polished mechanics into a multiplayer deathmatch game is actually very easy to do and it makes for a great game despite being relatively low effort. I did also have that weird issue that I had in Counter-Strike Source though. I tried to join other servers but no matter which server I clicked on in the server browser it forced me back into the server that I had already been playing on. But that's a pretty non-issue if you just want to pop in and play around or two every now and then. Funnily enough, this is probably my biggest recommendation of any game on the list, because games like Portal 2 and Team Fortress 2 and Half-Life 2, they are all much more worth mentioning. They're much bigger and more obvious recommendations, sure, but they're also significantly more popular than this game too. So if I had to recommend just one game on this list for players to go and try out, it would definitely be Half-Life 2 Deathmatch, because it's incredibly fun and it's incredibly underrated. My biggest gripe with Half-Life 2 Deathmatch was that some bastard named Nassau was way better than everyone else in the server and he kept owning me every time he saw me. He ruined my fun the entire time, this f***. Perhaps a lack of objectives might turn certain players off, because there's no payload or control points or flag or anything like that. It's just deathmatch. The objective is to kill enemy noobs, and that's it. And if that doesn't sound good to you, then to each their own. But the incredibly fast-paced combat alone is enough incentive for me personally to play this game for hours. And I don't think I could possibly give a game higher praise than that. <laughs> Day of Defeat Source goes the same way as Counter-Strike did on its upgrade to the Source engine. It simply makes the game better in literally every way without changing the gameplay at all, while still maintaining what made it so good in the first place. It improved the visuals and the gunplay and the responsiveness of a game that already had incredibly good fundamentals to work with. The gameplay is still great. It's that incredible mix of class-based shooter and tactical shooter that made the original Day of Defeat so good. A style that fits the World War II set far better than the likes of Call of Duty and Battlefield ever did in my opinion. It's all the greatness of the original Day of Defeat with a new coat of paint. Oh, and it has actual human being players. That's pretty cool too. The original Day of Defeat doesn't have that nowadays. Something I did notice while playing that I thought was worth mentioning was the sheer power of the rifle classes. The bolt action rifles can kill anyone from any range in one shot so long as you don't hit them in like the foot or something. And they have pinpoint accuracy at any range, both shot from the hip and with iron sights. There's a sniper class in the game that has a rifle with the exact same properties and it also has a scope, but the scope has a built-in realistic wobble to make aiming your shots while scoped in just a little bit harder. But this scope wobble makes sniper just a bit obsolete compared to normal rifles. There's no wobble to your iron sights with a normal rifle and it has the same effective range so long as your aim is good enough. You can even insta-kill people in close quarters range shooting from the hip, which brings into question the effectiveness of some of the more close quarters based classes too. The rifles felt like they were a better option than most other classes most of the time because they were far more versatile, being effective in both close and long range. If Day of Defeat Source was a game that was popular, it might perhaps get balance patches to fix problems like this, but it lacks the popularity of Dota and Counter-Strike. I mean, even TF2 isn't popular to get the attention of Valve, and that game is the 10th most popular game on Steam, so Day of Defeat Source has got no chance.
So there's this little game on the Wikipedia list for all Valve games called Half-Life 2 Lost Coast. But its presence on this list is really, really quite strange. Because Lost Coast is not a video game. It's barely even a video game level. Half-Life 2 Lost Coast is a tech demo for the Source engine that they released as a free update to everyone who already owned Half-Life 2. It was a tech demo to show off the Source engine's high dynamic range. That is the range of brightnesses that the engine could render all at once. Very low level lighting being occluded by very very bright rays of light from the outside. This is not a video game. Not really. It's incredibly short, about a fifth of the length of the average Half-Life 2 chapter. You climb up a cliff face, destroy some combine doodad at the top of a cliff in the church, then you shoot down a gunship. It's a spectacle for sure, but that's about it. But it's on the list, so I played it. And now I'm talking about it. And I have very, very little to say about it. I mean, there was like a couple of bugs in a tech demo, that's pretty funny. This combine soldier got stuck in a wall, and there's a missing texture under the water if you fall into it and die. That's funny, I guess. But that's really all I have to say about it. It's fun, I guess, because Half-Life 2 gameplay is fun, but it's not exactly worth talking about for even as close to as long as I already have. Episode 1's story picks up shortly after Half-Life 2's, and it does a great job of continuing that storyline organically. The game is significantly shorter than the main entry to Half-Life 2, but I actually found that this helped the game in some ways rather than hindering it. The new mechanics it added were a breath of fresh air, and the shorter duration prevented the game from ever getting repetitive or stale, which was an issue that Half-Life 2 suffered from every now and then. Its gameplay mechanics aren't too different from the main game of Half-Life 2. Like, there's this cool mechanic of blocking antlion nests with cars, and the zombified combine enemies are very cool as an addition. It gives you yet another layer of interaction with combat when they pull out their grenades. Something that I will bring up though is that playing this game immediately after playing Half-Life 2 definitely ruined the experience for me. <laughs> it's obviously not an issue that anybody else would have, but the formula of puzzles into combat into dialogue into puzzles certainly started grating after playing like 12 hours of Half-Life in a day. But despite that overly specific gripe, the game is fantastic, and the story is as well. The levels feel differentiated enough from the main game to make it worth playing for more than just its story. And there's far fewer scenes with annoying stuff like friendly NPCs body blocking me, or weird issues with not being able to find where to go. The final stretch of the game does involve friendly NPCs. You're supposed to escort them across a huge area safely to get them to an escape train. But the trick is, you can actually just run as fast as you can to the end and the NPCs will make it without a scratch on them anyway, despite the fact that you didn't actually help them at all. It's a little bit immersion breaking, I guess, but quite frankly, after my experience with the NPCs in Half-Life 2, I was okay with it. Then the game ends with a cool Strider fight section. It feels a little bit too scripted at times, like I know it's literally scripted because it's a single player game, but somehow this part feels more scripted than the rest, almost like it was community made. But it's still fun, and it still requires interesting solutions to problems that you face and all that good stuff that Half-Life's known for. And the cliffhanger left at the end is amazing. And that leads us, quite nicely, into Dr. Freeman. God, I wish Valve still made games. I really do. The story of Half-Life 2 Episode 2 is amazing. Everything truly feels like it's coming to a head in this game, readying the audience for the climax that's soon to come. The reveal of the Aperture Science Borealis is huge. Eli begins talking about your mutual friend, referring to the G-Man, setting up a future reveal to his true motivations. Alex dies. Kinda. Eli dies. Kinda. Everything was supposed to be coming to a head, where every question you could possibly want an answer to is being answered in the third and final instalment of the episode's trilogy. And then it never came. They just never made it. Half-Life Alex is the most recent Half-Life game, and that is a prequel that only barely touches on the events of Episode 2. A cool addition to the story, a hint at what's to come, great, but not even close to the grand finale that we were expecting, and let's face it, that we were promised by the man himself. The story is presented in this game better than it is in any other Half-Life game that came before it, at least in my opinion. And every story arc that could possibly be wrapped up starts to get dangled in front of you like a carrot on a stick, only for Valve to literally decide that they had no more desire to work on Half-Life as a franchise anymore. Not because of business reasons, and not because of technical reasons, they just weren't feeling it. They were worried about scope creep, where the game would get too big to realistically be finished, and as time went on, the prospect of 
releasing a Half-Life game to a ravenous audience that would be hypercritical of it was just too frightening a thought for Valve. So they just never did. But I guess crying into the void about it isn't actually going to change anything, so I guess we'll talk about gameplay now. This game certainly feels less repetitive than the other two Half-Life games ever did. I think it's because of enemy and location variety. There's a couple of new enemies in this game, and they have to be fought very differently than the rest of the enemies. Especially the Hunters. This enemy is very, very cool. A nice addition to the game for sure. The part where you have to defend Alex and the Vaults is amazing, even though it is relatively similar to the sections from Nova Prospect. The fact that you have to pick your tunnel and move the turrets around makes it much better than just statically standing there and waiting for things to happen. It makes you think on your feet more, and the NPCs helping you is an amazing addition. It feels like the ideas present in this one are more fleshed out, they're more interesting and unique, and they rarely feel like they're reusing concepts to pad runtime. But unfortunately, Valve works in mysterious ways. Their stupid internal structure means that they don't have to put their stories or their consumers first. So Half-Life wasn't really ever seen again. Not until Half-Life Alex, which was VR exclusive, so most people couldn't experience the story outside of watching cutscenes on YouTube. One day I hope that Valve will finally revamp this franchise, and revamp it in a way that doesn't make it hard to access for most users. Whether this will happen or not, I have no idea. But I can hope. Portal is a fantastic video game. Valve did their classic manoeuvre of acquiring talented developers to make them a game, but this time it wasn't acquiring a mod team or a studio. It was instead a team of university students. A team of devs who were studying at the DigiPen University made a little gem called Narbacula Drop. Robin Walker, a prominent employee at Valve, saw their game at a DigiPen career fair and invited the team to present the game at Valve's headquarters. Gabe Newell himself was so impressed with the concept that he offered the entire team of devs jobs at Valve to to work on development of a new game with the same gameplay concept. And that game became Portal. Portal isn't exactly a long game, but its mechanics are pushed just to the edge of where they would become boring, and then the game either moves on or flips the mechanic on its head to make something more complex. This completely brand new concept for a puzzle mechanic is amazing to play with, and the decision to change the theming from whatever this is to a gritty futuristic testing facility is of course a great choice. The story in Portal is told very subtly. These little hidden rooms in some test chambers as well as some voice lines from GLaDOS are really all the story tells you, but I think that it's a pretty cool way of telling the story nonetheless. There's not really that much to tell other than good world building, so it doesn't need to hold your hand with trying to teach you the story. The atmosphere is awesome, the story is awesome, and the gameplay is awesome. I don't really know what more you could want from a puzzle game, to be honest. The biggest gripe with the game realistically is that a lot of the puzzles are very broken. You can skip many things in the game with simple mechanics in ways that Valve just simply didn't foresee. In a handful of levels, you can literally just do a simple fling straight to the end of the puzzle, skipping everything entirely. And there's a couple of unintended mechanics that let you skip things too. Like you can bump portals. If you shoot one portal atop another, the second portal will get bumped off to the side. So you can bump your portals through walls to skip things. Or like peek -a portaling where you can shoot a portal through another portal with a little sidestep and be able to keep moving your destination portal without actually having to go anywhere. But this is only something I know exists because the game came out in 2007 and I've played it a thousand times. Without this knowledge, the game is practically flawless. The game was released at the exact same time that Half-Life 2 Episode 2 was, bundled in with a few other games in the orange box. The orange box being like the best deal in video game history. So the story tie-in from Half-Life and Portal started here, and I will say that I think it's amazing. In Portal, the references to Half-Life are relatively subtle. There's a projector that talks about Black Mesa hidden away somewhere outside of Aperture's test chambers, and GLaDOS has a line in her boss fight where she says this. Are you trying to escape? <laughs> Things have changed since the last time you left the building. What's going on out there will make you wish you were back in here. I have an infinite capacity for knowledge, and even I'm not sure what's going on outside. All I know is I'm the only thing standing between us and them. Well... I was. But this is as far as the references go in Portal. But in Half-Life 2 Episode 2, the tie-in is far more obvious and far more significant. A ship called the Borealis with a huge Aperture Science logo on the side is discussed by Dr. Kleiner. The Combine can't use local teleportation in Half-Life, and the only reason that humanity is still kept alive is because the Combine thinks that the humans will be the first people to crack that tech. Not knowing that the humans already had, years before the Combine even knew Earth existed. Down in a mysterious secret lab, 
lab thousands of meters below the surface, a portal gun had already been developed, and the Borealis likely has this technology on board. The Borealis was likely to be mentioned even more in future Half-Life games, but as we all know, that Half-Life game never came, because Valve are stupid. But this tie-in is amazing, and at one point in the next 100 years, the connection between these two stories will come to the surface once again. When that will be, only time will tell. You know, hopefully sooner rather than later. If you've watched a single video I've ever made, then you likely don't need me to tell you anything about this video game at all. I have a lot of videos where I talk about TF2, and unfortunately, most of those videos are actually very negative, funnily enough. But sometimes that's how it goes. Sometimes the pieces of media that you love the most are the things that you're most critical of. Because make no mistake, Team Fortress 2 is in my top two best video games ever made. And quite frankly, it's not even close. So after all my negativity about this game in all my other videos, for once let me be positive about such an incredible game. The movement system in TF2 is hands down the best movement system ever devised. The way air strafing works in the Source engine combined with the absolutely ridiculous mobility that the Soldier and Demo afford themselves is a perfect recipe for some of the most fun you can possibly have in a video game. And the weapon designs complement this perfectly. The Market Gardener is probably the best designed item in any video game ever made. Fucking rocket. I'm gonna kill him. Oh! oh. <laughs> that clip was sick! <laughs> It might be a little on the overpowered side, but honestly, who cares? Look at how fun it is. They take an insane movement mechanic, a mechanic that there's no doubt in my mind that the devs don't fully understand even as close to as much as their community does, and they add a tricky to pull off combo with this movement. Incredibly high risk, but incredibly high reward. And it's magnificent. It's so simple, yet it works so well. And this is one of many, many, many examples of such a design philosophy. Valve has always had an issue with balancing their game. No doubt about it. But they're making a game for a predominantly casual audience, whether the Sixes players want to admit it or not. And in a casual setting, the game is a masterpiece. The comedy this game can produce. Behind you. Don't say behind me. Oh, there actually is someone behind <laughs> <laughs> you. The insanely high skill ceiling that hasn't and never will peak. Oh! 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 I hit them all! Oh, I missed I it. I hit the I hit <laughs> Wait, Charon, Charon got quinted by, by, by three different people. I hit a double, HG hit a double, and then Fritter is single. Clip that, HG, please. And the awesome niche communities that have sprouted from the game. This game might have been in development limbo for a long time, and it might never get development again. But TF2 is a top 10 game on Steam to this day. The game will never die. And it's not because the community is so strong and tenacious or any of that wholesome stuff that people like to say. It's simply because the game is phenomenal. Even without development. Even with the issues it's been facing, the game is a masterpiece. And funnily enough, it's hard to convince people to stop playing a game that is probably one of the best video games ever created. <laughs> Guys, the video's peaked. I've talked about the best video game on the list. We can all go home now. Left 4 Dead is just another notch on Valve's bedstead for buying developers and having them make games for them. Valve had used Turtle Rock Studios in the past, as a third party developer for certain console ports, as well as the development of Counter Strike Condition Zero. Which, to be honest, if I were them, I wouldn't put that on my list of accomplishments, but hey ho. In 2005, they presented an idea for a zombie game to Valve, who then acquired the company and development began. Now, I'm gonna bundle Left 4 Dead 1 and 2 together here, simply because all of Left 4 Dead 1's missions are also present in Left 4 Dead 2, just with a few more special infected and a few more weapon types. It seemed reasonable to bundle these games together on the list, because when Left 4 Dead 2 was announced, people were rightly pissed. Fans of the first game felt that Left 4 Dead 2 could have easily been released as a paid DLC for the first game, since the mechanics were mostly the same, as were most of the assets. And Left 4 Dead 2 released exactly a year after the first game did, the community being made to spend full AAA price on a game not once, but twice, despite how similar they were, didn't feel very fair. And if you were a person who decided to not buy Left 4 Dead 2 out of spite, you were stuck with Left 4 Dead 1, a game which would have its development completely ceased and its community split in two. So even at the time, Left 4 Dead fans agreed with me that the games were very similar before the sequel even released. But aside from that controversy, the Left 4 Dead franchise is fantastic, and it defined an entire genre of horde shooters that came after it, including Back for Blood, a game that Turtle Rock Studios, the people that made Left 4 Dead, split away from Valve in order to make. And again, 
game that by all accounts has far less polish than Left 4 Dead did all the way back in 2008 and 9. Left 4 Dead 2 is very clever and elegant in its design because in all of the chaos of the crazy hordes of hundreds of zombies, teamwork and smart strategy is being forced upon players with nothing more than clever game design. Each of the special infected force you to work in a team and to play the game in an exciting manner. If you don't play as a team, the variety of enemies that can render you helpless alone will pick you off one by one. Without teammates, a single special infected will kill you instantly. And the special infected prevent boring play too. If you camp too hard, the spitter can make the zone you're stood in completely untouchable with the level of damage that acid can deal. And smokers, jockeys and chargers can displace survivors, dragging them away from their team. This displacement also prevents players from moving around as one big clump, forcing players to react to the game and play strategically. And if you thought you could just hold left click and mindlessly shoot whatever's in front of you, the boomer and the witch will force you to think twice before you fire. Every single design decision made in Left 4 Dead 2 is done to promote fun gameplay. Not by forcing you into it, but by making it the optimal way to play. And amidst all of that chaos, with your screen full of zombies, you still never get lost. You still never get confused. And the reason for this is because the incredible sound design won't let you get confused. Each special infected has multiple audio cues, both a music cue and a diegetic audio cue. This makes it practically impossible to not know what threats are currently present on the map, and you will always know what to prioritise first, even amidst all of the chaos. Despite the constant onslaught of crazy flashing lights and colours and sounds, you still manage to know exactly what's happening. And the atmosphere and the story and the character design is all immaculate. Each of these characters, despite not really having much time to exposit dialogue onto the player, somehow feels incredibly unique and full of personality. Even in a game which isn't all that story centred, these characters have incredible depths to them. Unfortunately for us though, Left 4 Dead is another casualty in Valve's quest to never do what the majority of their consumers want. Because they were working on a Left 4 Dead 3, but long story short, its development was completely cancelled despite the fact that the game was basically completely finished. Because their new game engine, Source 2, wasn't ready for a Left 4 Dead 3 yet, so some devs wanted to ship it in Source 1 or even the Unreal Engine. But then some other devs demanded Source 2. This argument was never resolved because because Valve is a huge house made of matchsticks and doesn't have a traditional hierarchy because the company is stupid. So the project was ditched entirely because no one in hierarchy is able to come down and force the decision to get resolved. So no Left 4 Dead 3 for us, I guess. Thanks Valve. So uh, I have a confession to make. You know, you know when I said in the title that I had played every Valve game in a week? You know, like, in the title and stuff? Well, I might have lied. I, I, I might have lied just a little bit. You see, I wasn't actually able to play Alien Swarm. I tried my hardest. Honest to God, I tried my hardest. But I just couldn't play it. You see, Alien Swarm is a cooperative campaign-based experience. You know, Left 4 Dead sort of vibe. Complete missions with objectives and kill swarms of whatever nasty creature you can come up with. But for some reason, for some completely inexplicable reason, Valve decided that Alien Swarm should only be available in multiplayer, with no single player experience whatsoever. Alien Swarm has no single player option available whatsoever. No way to play with bots as far as I could tell. Yet the game forces you to have at least two players to complete any mission. I tried to ask friends, but they weren't interested. I tried to play with randoms, and I would show you that the game crashed and disconnected both times I tried to do that, but Nvidia Shadowplay decided it wanted to record the main menu more than it wanted to show what I was actually doing on my screen. Like, you can hear that I'm clicking around in a menu, but it just doesn't show it for some reason. This game's cursed. Connection problems. Woo! Connection problems. So sorry, guys. I, I, I lied. I, I, I didn't play every Valve game. I'm sorry. Hashtag H2 is over by. Hello! Oh, it's you. You know her? It's been a long time. Portal 2 is a masterpiece. I will just say it straight out of the gate. The game's a masterpiece. Portal 1 is a fantastic game, and I personally think that Portal 2 is a step up from the first game in literally every conceivable way. Portal 2 has more of a story, and the story is told better. Not everybody likes that sort of thing, but for me, it's a bonus. Portal 2's puzzles are more fleshed out, with more unique mechanics. There's more of them, and they're harder to cheat. Portal 2's visuals are significantly 
significantly improved, and the different areas of Aperture Science's facilities having drastically different aesthetics is a nice change of pace from the first game's two different main settings. Portal 2 also has a co-op mode. <laughs> Sorry to think! Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh, I had a, I had an that's bug. Yeah. You need to catch me. <laughs> Wait, what the fuck? What's what happening? the fuck? What the fuck? Uh, <laughs> I crashed the game. It's very funny. I actually have a cool edit of me and Sharon playing Portal 2 co-op on my second channel. You should go watch it. Link's in the link places. Portal 2 fleshes out everything. From the puzzles, to the characters, to the story, to the setting, to the mechanics. Everything is so incredibly well executed and it's done in a completely timeless fashion. With an art style gritty enough to be taken seriously, but cartoonishly enough to age very well into the future and get away with being a bit goofy and funny sometimes. Portal 2 isn't flawless, of course, because some puzzles are still cheatable, but these things are such minuscule complaints that I honestly can't see myself or anyone else truly caring about any of that at all. It's a well-presented puzzle game with easy-to-understand mechanics used to make complex puzzles, and its story is incredibly well-written, despite being slightly goofy here and there. Masterpiece. Counter-Strike Global Offensive is an interesting one, because it's a game that's clearly very, very good. Well-polished, awesome gunplay, very high skill ceiling with insane mechanical complexity, as well as strategic complexity. The most popular game on Steam by a fairly large margin, beloved by many. But I don't like it. I do not like this game very much. For the same reason I don't like all the other Counter-Strike games. And for the same reason I don't really like Valorant. I just don't really like tactical shooters. My kind of shooter is Team Fortress 2. Half-Life 2 Deathmatch. Deathmatch Classic. Fast-paced, crazy movement, cool projectile weapons, and relatively fast respawns. There's nothing wrong with slower-paced games, with more emphasis on strategy, with crazy hitscan flicks being more important than nutty air shots. It's just not for me. What is for me is surfing. And CSGO has surfing, just like CS Source does. I like a good surf map, even if I'm not very good at it. CSGO's most notable complaint for me, as a person who doesn't really play it or like it, is the skin market. CSGO loot boxes are gambling, no doubt about it, and they use all the same strategies that real life slot machines use, except there's no regulation on their odds. And CSGO loot boxes are a very realistic gateway into CSGO skin gambling sites that are very active nowadays, which themselves are gateways into actual online casino gambling. Gambling can be a very dangerous thing, even if it can be very fun from time to time, and I think that CSGO incentivizes gambling more so than any other Valve game does. And personally, I'm not a big fan of that. I'm gonna preface this part with a very simple statement. I'm a League of Legends player. Or at least I was. Back when I used to actually enjoy MOBA games, my game of choice was not Dota 2, it was League of Legends. So you can probably imagine that I wasn't the biggest fan of Dota 2. I didn't really get into it. The game vaguely made sense to me, because of the prior understanding I had of the MOBA genre as a whole from playing League of Legends, but the ins and outs of it were hard for me to understand. And of course, Dota's tutorial was very bad, because apparently it's like a rite of passage for MOBA tutorials to be really bad, I guess. So the item shop was poorly explained to me, which types of heroes should build what and what lanes they play in. Stuff like that. None of this is explained well. None of that made any sense to me because the tutorial didn't even slightly attempt to explain it. And don't get me wrong, this is an issue League of Legends has too. But if I complain about it in League, I'm gonna complain about it in Dota 2. Dota 2 is of course yet another example added to the pile of Valve buying up old game devs to make stuff on their behalf. Dota stands for Defense of the Ancients. Defense of the Ancients being an old Warcraft 3 mod. Valve hired those developers to make them a Dota 2 and the rest is history, just like it always is. To be honest, my bias from being a person who played League of Legends for six years makes it very hard to objectively rate this game in any way. Like, they're just so different from each other. League of Legends has far more emphasis on mechanical skill rather than crazy strategically coordinated plays. And there's nothing wrong with those differences. They just make the games unlike each other and makes the topic of which is better very polarizing. The only thing I think I can really say is that Dota 2 is certainly more visually noisy than League of Legends ever is. It's far harder to tell what's going on in Dota 2 than it is in League of Legends. Perhaps that's my bias talking, but I'm not the only person to have made this observation in the past. So I played one game of Dota 2 against human players, and I lost. And five players were ending the game mid, while two of my teammates rage split bot lane and let them win. So hey, maybe, uh, maybe League and Dota aren't that different after all. Artifact is a card game that's too complicated for its own good, and the fan base of Dota didn't even want it in the first place. 
artifact is basically like playing three card games all at once. Hero cards are minions that can equip multiple items and also have active abilities. Hero cards have colours that restrict what cards you can play on any certain lane. Towers also have active abilities themselves. Spells and minions have just as many complex effects as they would in any other card game. Combat has its own little quirks of which unit attacks what and how. And all of that would be a lot to pay attention to on its own. But you have to take it into account on three different boards all at once. Each lane is like its own little card game, and neglecting any of your three lanes will lose you the game fast. It's incredibly well presented, and there's no doubt in my mind that the game is very deep and skill expressive, but it's too complicated for its own good, because as much as pro players like to maybe not admit it, a game needs a casual audience. It needs to be able to attract at least some noobs to play the game, because if an incredibly complex and competitive game doesn't have a casual audience, then an esports tournament you hope to host in that game won't have an audience either. No casual audience means no tournaments, so Artifact's insane level of complexity is actually a downside for all but the most dedicated card game goblins. But after the botched release of Artifact, Valve agreed to go back to the drawing board and make the game again. They produced Artifact Foundry, which in short is basically the exact same game, but each lane attacks all at once instead of separately. So it's like playing one card game instead of three card games. But by the time this game had released, it was already too late. Artifact had its bad reputation already, and Valve's idiosyncratic hierarchical structure meant that most of the devs working on Artifact left immediately after the botched launch to go work on VR or whatever. So Artifact Foundry, despite being a much more approachable card game, came far too late and had far less polish. You'll notice instantly that Artifact Foundry is significantly less well presented than the original, looking more like a mobile game than a standalone Valve title. This is likely because of those developers flocking to projects that they had more passion for. So Artifact Foundry 2 is dead in the water, coming too late to meaningfully solve any of Artifact's real issues. Artifact was no doubt a very impressive game, tons of strategy and depth to it, but not everyone is a crazy card game nerd, and if you scare off the noobs, you scare off the majority of your audience, and then the game dies, just like Artifact did. Also, Valve did Richard Garfield dirty. I'll start this off in a similar way to how I started talking about Dota 2. I am a Teamfight Tactics player. Teamfight Tactics is my auto battler of choice, and if I strip away my bias, Dota 2 and League of Legends are equal yet different in my eyes. But no matter how hard I try, the same cannot be said for Dota Underlords. Because Riot Games seem to have taken up the mantle of the Masters of Presentation, a title that Valve once held themselves. Valve used to be the ones making games that were incredibly beautiful while still being being very easy to read with good audio and visual design. But Dota Underlords is a mess. The combat phases in an auto battler are meant to be messy and complicated, but in teamfight tactics it is far easier to know where to look, to know what's important to pay attention to and what's less significant. But in Dota Underlords, the entire screen is full of garbage all the time, regardless of how big or small the effect of the ability is, regardless of how much damage it's doing. The screen is literally full of garbage constantly and the presentation of the traits, what they do, and how they activate is far worse. The traits are over here on the right. Telling that a trait is active can be a pain for new players, but once you get used to it, it's not too hard. But telling which of your units will go up a star level in the shop, or telling which characters share traits and which don't, reading what their abilities do, and even just the shop in general, is presented in a far worse way. It's far harder to understand what's going on. Learning a new auto battler is already hard enough as it is, because they use characters from an IP that you might not be familiar with, but the insane levels of visual clutter and weird UI design make this game a pain to learn. But at least the game does have a tutorial, something that Teamfight Tactics still doesn't have to this day. The inability to combine items into stronger ones makes Dota Underlords lose a little bit of depth, but it gains that depth back with the Underlord units. These are essentially powerful hero units with a variety of different attributes. This is a relatively interesting concept, but without content updates, using the same ones over and over would get very old very quickly. Where Dota and League are equals, Underlords and Teamfight Tactics are certainly not. Teamfight Tactics is a far more polished, far easier to understand, and far more content-rich game. And understandably, it's more popular for it. 
This is every single Valve game ever made that isn't a VR title or a Steam Deck exclusive. Honestly, I had a blast making this, but as you can probably tell, the video is quite a lot longer than what I would usually make. There's a couple of games that aren't on here that probably should be. Most notably, Half-Life Blue Shift and Half-Life Opposing Force. These are technically expansion packs that were developed by Gearbox and not Valve, which is why they're not on the list. I would have liked to play them anyway, but I really didn't have time to play these and still get the video made. If you like the longer videos then do let me know by doing all of the you know the stuff the the buttons you can click that youtube algorithm likes valve's back catalog of games is truly a sight to behold with many incredible genre defining games listed on here my biggest hope is that valve actually starts making games again one day soon thanks for watching